Ave Maria. Welcome to the History Program, a monthly series of programs produced by the Franciscans of the Immaculate for Gate of Heaven Radio. In this series, we will be looking at events in history, famous people in history, including saints and blesseds, foundations of religious orders, and much more. In short, anything in history that has a Catholic perspective. Our objective will be to tell you the facts as recorded by history. We will not be entering into polemics nor aiming to generate any controversy. If we venture an opinion, we will say so. You are free to agree or disagree. This month's programme is entitled Glendalough, Glory of Irish Monasticism, Part 1. The Dublin Wicklow Mountains lie just a short distance from the city of Dublin, a beautiful scenic area comprising hills, glens and lakes. The mountains have always been a favourite place for hill walkers, as I well know, having been an enthusiastic hill walker in my day. One of the most beautiful and popular places in this whole countryside is a place that is still venerated as one of the holy places of Ireland. It is one of the glories of ancient Irish monastic life. It is Glendalough. The name Glendalough is derived from the Irish language Glan da Loch, the Glen of the Two Lakes, which describes the area in which the monastery was located. However, before we look at the monastery itself, let us take a look at the life of its founder and first abbot, Saint Kevin. The name Kevin is an English translation of the Irish name Quivain and means fair begotten one. Kevin was born in the eastern part of Leinster, probably towards the close of the 5th century or early in the 6th century. He was of noble lineage, his father being of a royal line that gave kings to Leinster down to 495 AD. It is said that Kevin's uncle was Saint Owen, or in the English language Eugene, Bishop of Ardstraw, who was now venerated as the patron of the Diocese of Derry. It is also said that one of his brothers succeeded Saint Columba at Terryglass. When we look into the lives of early Irish saints such as Kevin, it is sometimes difficult to separate fact from legend. In his booklet, Glendalough, Its Story and Its Ruins, the Irish priest, scholar and baronet, Reverend Sir John O'Connell, relates some interesting legends surrounding the early life of Saint Kevin. Many legends gather around the instance in the life of St. Kevin, from his cradle to his grave. One legend tells how an angel appeared to his mother and said to her, O happy woman, thou shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Quivain. He shall be dear both to God and men, and he shall be a father over many monks. Another legend tells the story of his baptism, or blessing by a beautiful stranger who was afterwards found to have been an angel. Though the more prosaic and more probable account affirms that he was baptised by a priest named Cronin. Another legend records that during his infancy his parents were kept supplied with milk for the baby by a white cow, which appeared at his parents' house every morning and evening. A circumstance, naively remarks one of the saint's biographers, which caused no little degree of interest to be excited in the neighbourhood. The account of the chroniclers that from his childhood Kevin was wont to tend his father's flocks of sheep on the Wicklow Hills may easily be believed, since in those early times flocks and herds formed the chief source of wealth. In common with other Irish saints, 
Kevin had a love and tenderness for all God's creatures. And there are many stories handed down to us that illustrate this. In one story, we are told how one day his followers found him praying under a tree and a crowd of birds perched on his shoulders and his hands, flitting about him, singing to the saints of God. Remember, this was six centuries before the great Saint of Assisi. At the age of seven years, Kevin's parents placed him under the care of Saint Petroc, a holy monk who had moved away from his native Cornwall to live a life of prayer and contemplation in the Wicklow Mountains. Saint Petroc instructed Kevin in sacred scripture and trained him in the habits of sanctity and contemplation. Kevin remained under the care of Saint Petroc for 12 years, after which time the holy monk returned to Cornwall to found a great centre of learning and holiness known as Petrochstow, which eventually became known as Padstow, the name the area bears today. On the departure of St. Petroch, Kevin placed himself under the guidance of three holy men, St. Own, St. Lochon, and St. Enne. A fourth man, St. Lugard, may also have helped form Kevin, and we believe later ordained him to the priesthood. Saint Owen had founded the School of Learning and Piety at Kilnamana, not that far from Glendalough. Saint Owen had a desire to go to the north of Ireland to preach and wanted Kevin to succeed him as head of the school at Kilnamana. However, Kevin, not wishing such a responsibility, fled to the secluded valley of Lugala. A strong local tradition has it that Kevin built a small monastery on the shores of Loch Tay, by the waters of the Annamore River, as it flows into the lake. Here Kevin lived and prayed up to the time that he left for Glendalough. As Kevin's desire for even greater solitude, prayer and contemplation grew, he withdrew to Glendalough. There he chose to live in a cave, in the face of the rock at Lugduff Mountain, overhanging the southern shore of the upper lake, which lies 30 feet below. The Most Reverend Dr. Healy, in his book Ancient Schools and Scholars of Ireland, describes the life of our saint in his rock cell. The cave itself is only about four feet square, and not high enough to stand upright in. But there is a smaller hollow within which the saint might lay his head and snatch a few hours of brief repose. It was a dizzy height and a hard bed, but we cannot judge of the saints of God by our own worldly and selfish standard. Kevin spoke to no man, but he communed with God and nature His body was on the naked rock, but his soul was in heaven. It was during those years that the birds and beasts came to know and to love the gentle saint, who lived as Adam did in paradise. He had made for himself a hut of boughs on the northern shore of the lake, where he spent much of his time. And we are told that the birds used to come and alight on his hands and shoulders, and sing for him their sweetest songs, and that the trees were like Aeolian harps, whose melody lightened the toilsome routine of his life. As for his food, no man knows on what he lived during these years, for he never revealed it to anyone. As time went on, Kevin's reputation for holiness spread abroad and many men came to join him in his way of life. Kevin was forced to leave his seclusion and move to a place more accessible to his pupils. He built a small oratory on a rock projecting from the base of Lugduffin to the lake, known as Champel Neskelic, 
or in the English language, Church of the Rock. This oratory was one of the most primitive ecclesiastical structures in Ireland. Its internal dimensions measuring about 25 feet in length and 14 feet in width. Kevin's followers continued to increase and the little oratory was too small to hold them. So Kevin moved lower down the lake and built the church and the cemetery now known as Refarte Church. However, this may not have been the name of the church in the time of St. Kevin. The name Refarte in indicates that the place was a burial ground for kings. And it is likely that after Kevin's death, the kings of that part of Leinster chose to have it as their burial ground. As Kevin's followers continued to increase, the refarted church proved too small to hold them. And so, once again, it became necessary to move on. Father O'Connell tells us something interesting in this regard. The old life of the saint relates that one of God's angels came to him and told him to build a monastery on the eastern shore of the smaller lake about a half a mile eastward of the chapel. The message of the angel suggests that some of the disciples of Kevin had settled already by the banks of the lower lake, but that the saint was unwilling to accept the site already pointed out to him. The angel said, O saint of God, the Lord has sent me with a message that you may be induced to go to a place which he has appointed to you eastward from the lesser lake. There you shall be amongst your brethren, and it shall be the place of your resurrection. If it were God's will, said Kevin, I should prefer to stay to the day of my death in this place, where I toiled for Christ. Nay, said the angel, if you dwell where I say, Many thousands of happy souls shall arise with you from that happy place and go to their heavenly Father. Thus the angel led the saint to the eastward of the smaller lake and marked out the site of his church and monastery. And there Kevin built that celebrated monastery of the Valley of the Two Lakes, Glendalough, which was the mother house of many others. We should note that in questioning the angel, there was no self-will on Kevin's part. He only wished to continue his ascetic way of life. However, Kevin, as in everything else, bowed to the will of God. Kevin was greatly interested in the welfare of the Irish Church, which was sending missionaries all over Europe, and he made long and difficult journeys throughout the land to meet with other leaders of the Irish Church. On one occasion, Kevin journeyed into distant West Mead to attend a great conference at the hill of Ishnock, and there met up with his fellow abbots, Columba, Comgal, and Canis. On another occasion, he journeyed west to Clomachnoise, on the banks of the River Shannon, to meet with St. Ciaran, who was the abbot there. When he arrived at Clomac Noy's monastery, St. Ciaran had already passed on to his eternal reward just a few days beforehand. The story goes that when Kevin entered the chapel where St. Ciaran's remains were lying in repose awaiting burial, St. Ciaran appeared to him. There the two saints remained in conversation for 24 hours after which the remains of St. Ciaran were laid to rest and Kevin departed for home. It was probably after returning from the conference at the hill of Ishnok that Kevin built the sanctuary known as Cro Crivin, or in the English language, St. Kevin's Kitchen, or St. Kevin's House. This was an oblong oratory measuring about 20 
3 feet long and 15 feet wide at ground level. The building comprised two storeys, the top storey being an attic about 5 feet high and 5 feet wide. The entrance door was at the attic level, which was entered by way of a ladder. It is probable that the ground storey was the oratory and the attic served as Kevin's dormitory. A tower belfry with square windows rises nine feet above the entrance. Other buildings were added after Kevin's death, but they are no longer in existence. West of the main group of buildings and towards the lake stand the ruins of St Mary's Church, also known as Our Lady's Church. It is possible that this church also goes back to the time of St Kevin. The nave of this church measures about 32 feet by 20 feet and the chancel about 20 feet by 18 feet. The west door is almost 6 feet high with a huge lintel on which is cut a diagonal cross. Father O'Connell tells us of a curious legend which accounts for the building of this church. Kevin was warned in a vision of his approaching death and was directed to make a church east of the lesser lake where his resurrection was to be. Dimme and his sons gave him the site and asked where they would build the oratory. He replied, Round the shepherd's grave, cut away the thorns and thistles, my sons, and make a beautiful spot of the place. It is likely that this legend gave rise to the belief that it was in this church that St. Kevin was buried. In the second part of this programme, we will look at the round tower and the priest's house and the cathedral. However, for the moment, we should make reference to three other churches. Close to Crow Quivine lie the ruins of St. Chiron's church. These ruins were discovered relatively recently, in 1875. The church commemorates St. Chiron, the friend of St. Kevin and abbot of Clomacnois, and probably dates from the 11th century. On the northern bank of the Glen Dasson River, in a more open part of the valley, lie the ruins of Temple Netrinode, or Trinity Church, also known as Ivy Church. This is the most eastern of the group of churches known as the Seven Churches of Glendalock. Father O'Connell states that this church was built in or about the time of St. Kevin, and also that it may have been the home of St. Mokorog, who administered the last rites to St. Kevin. On the southern bank of the Glendasson River lie the ruins of St. Saviour's Church. This church probably dates from the 12th century. The canons regular of St. Augustine ministered here, and it is probable that St. Lawrence O'Toole presided in this church on his visits to Glendalough. Like many other holy men, Kevin was graced with the gift of miracles. Of course, we should always remember that it is God who works such miracles, and holy men like Kevin are only the instruments that he uses. One of the earliest miracles associated with Kevin dates from the time he was a young novice. Kevin was to accompany one of the senior monks to the woods where the other monks were at work, and he was asked by this senior monk to bring fire along with him. When they arrived at their destination and went to kindle the fire, it transpired that Kevin had forgotten to bring the fire. The senior monk cried out, Brother, run quickly for the fire and bring it with you. Kevin answered in what manner he should bear it, and the senior monk hastily answered, In your bosom. 
Kevin obeyed and returned to the kitchen, placing a burning torch and some live coals in his bosom. He returned to the senior monk and threw the torch and coals on the ground where the fire was to be lit. Kevin's reward for his obedience was that not only his flesh, but his clothes also were unaffected by the fire. On another occasion, later in life, one of the workmen engaged on stonework in the vicinity lost the sight of one of his eyes when a particle of stone hit it. The monks called Kevin from his oratory. Kevin placed his hand over the workman's eye and prayed for him. Immediately, the man's sight was restored and no trace of a wound remained. Other miracles record Kevin raising dead people to life. And on one occasion, he miraculously changed water into wine and restored flesh meat to bared bones to provide meals for an unexpected crowd of pilgrims. There was one particular aspect of Glendalough that made its name famous throughout Christendom, right from the time of St. Kevin. We speak of its school of learning. In a previous episode of the History Programme, we had a detailed look at life in an ancient Irish monastery. Many of these monasteries had a school attached to them, but the school attached to Glendalough was one of the greatest of them all. Father O'Connell writes, Even during his life, St. Kevin had the joy of seeing the School of Sanctity and Learning, which he had founded in the Valley of the Two Lakes, grow year by year in influence and renown. Several of his pupils followed in his footsteps and founded schools and monasteries in different parts of Ireland. Amongst his disciples, special mention is made of St. Berak, whose sanctuary on the shores of Dublin Bay near Sutton is identified with Kilbarrick, and who founded a great monastery at Tarmonbury on the banks of the River Shannon. And of St. Aidan, Bishop of Ferns, and of the great prophet and anchorite of the River Barrow, St. Mulling, who is still commemorated by St. Mullins on that river. Indeed, Glendalough may truly be said to have been a school of saints. For, in addition to those already named, its tradition of sanctity was continued by, by St. Moliba, or Liba, and who was not only abbot, but also the first of that line of bishops of Glendalough, which continued down to 1182. The School of Learning at Glendalough attracted not only pupils from all over Ireland, but also many from distant lands. One of the Irish bards, Angus de Cooley, writing about 800 AD, declared that the Rome of the Western world is multitudinous Glendalough. Several generations later, another poet wrote, I never heard in any province between earth and holy heaven of a nun like St. Bridget or a cleric like Kevin. Father O'Connell writes, the unanimous verdict of the most distinguished historians, both of the continent and of England, Protestant as well as Catholic, approves the statement of Dr. Johnson that Ireland was the school of the West, the quiet habitation of sanctity and literature and records that from the 6th to the 10th century, whilst the peoples of Europe were torn asunder by internal struggles and racial wars, Ireland, and Ireland alone of all the nations, kept the lamp of faith and of knowledge alight and burning with a brightness which diffused its rays far beyond the shores of Erin. From the seagirt isle of Columba to the blue waters of the Gulf of Taranto, from the Marne to the Danube, from Mo to Salzburg, and from Würzburg to Bobbio. In every country and amongst every people in Europe, 
the sons of the island of saints were to be found teaching and preaching the knowledge and the love of God. From Ireland, says St. Bernard, as from an overflowing stream, crowds of holy men descended on foreign nations. That the school of St. Kevin took its share in this noble mission, there is ample evidence. To give one instance alone, we find it recorded that St. Killian founded the famous monastery of Würzburg, and if the saint was not himself a pupil of Glendalough, others who joined him in that great monastery and preserved its traditions and continued its teaching undoubtedly drew their inspiration from the valley of the two lakes. For we find it recorded in the annals of the four masters that Gillen the Nave Lagan died in 1085 and he is described as formerly Bishop of Glendalough and then head of the monks of Würzburg. The more common view is that St. Kevin was never raised to the episcopacy, Glendalough only becoming a diocese after his death. St. Kevin lived to a ripe old age, dying on the 3rd of June, 618. He gave his parting benediction to his monks who stood in tears around his bed and then received the last rites from St. Muckerog, a Briton who lived nearby. Some sources give the year of his birth as early as 498, which would mean he lived to the age of 120 years. St. Kevin left us a wonderful legacy in the monastery of Glendalough, which thrived for hundreds of years after his death. As Father O'Connell tells us, the reputation for sanctity of Glendalough is best attested by the fact that for many generations pilgrims flocked to it as to another Rome. In part two of this programme, we will have a look at other buildings added after the death of St. Kevin, including the cathedral and the round tower, and the life of one of its most illustrious abbots, St. Lawrence O'Toole. We hope you can join us then. This episode of the History Programme was researched and presented by Frostalanus for Gate of Heaven Radio. We hope you have enjoyed it and will join us again next month for another episode of the History Programme. Ave Maria. <laughs>